So let me ask, having gone through these several verses in Romans chapter 8, particularly, these are verses that have been dealing with the issue of the believer's security. Um, security in our salvation. Have you taken these to heart? Has it affected your faith? Have you looked at what has been said and what has been written? Uh, do recall that in many pulpits, you, you have guys who can get up in front of vast audiences who are wordsmiths. They have silver tongues who can be very persuasive in getting people to acknowledge and adapt and accept whatever is being um, offered, whatever is being promoted. I would certainly hope that would not be true here because our standard of reference, what, what convicts us and what encourages us should be this right here. What God has said. And that is what we need to find out is true. And so the question is, and you have to answer this to yourself, has it affected your faith? Has it affected what you understand? Cognitively, our understanding, yes. Also, our hearts. Has it affected that too? Has it improved us? Okay, improve is not, not the word. Well, edified us. Has it edified us? In our faith, certainly. Are you, as, as the song goes, are you safe and secure from all alarm? No, I'm not going to sing any more of that. Okay, we, we, you know, we sing these songs that go up there. Are we just kind of staring at the wall and not singing because you question the quality of your voice? I don't know. We just kind of watch what, whatever's going on here. I hope what goes up on there is speaking to us. As some lyricist, sometimes someplace, wrote down under the influence of Holy Spirit, took scripture, did something, turned it into lyrics to edify our life. So, are we safe and secure from all alarm? A father would not want his kids to walk around terrified that they're going to have their salvation lost, forsaken, or revoked. He doesn't want that. Could, could we face the, the, the accusation? Have you ever had someone do this to you, accused, accused you? They, they've, they've looked at you. I'll look at the hand and they go, Do you believe in that eternal security? They've done that to you. Admit it. Someone's done that to you at some point. They haven't? They have to me. Well, you need to get out more. Maybe you need to get out more. This is true. I've had that done to me. And immediately I go, you know, with the tone and with the look, it's like, it's like, Friend, I know you believe some other doctrine. And you're going to keep on believing that. Yet, my good news to you is even though you may not believe what comes out of the Word, remember, believing what comes out of the Word, it's not what Bob believes, believing what comes out of the Word that is still applicable to you. It works for you even though you may not buy into it. Was I clear on that? I hope so. God does not want us to be walking around scared all the time. Someone in the room told me, and, and I remember that, you know, it's like, what, what, what is our faith? Is it like a daisy? You know, he loves me. Oh, he loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. I don't think so. What he has done in foreseeing us, predestinating us, calling, justifying, and eventually glorifying us, would he undo all that? 
If you have a better insight into all that, I would hope it's not from persecution or from the pulpit or, or being persuaded from what I say. We hope it comes from the Word. The Word is first, the first is last, the Word is everything in between. So, we are asked in verse 31, what shall we say to these things? Without all the other numerous scriptural supports for our eternal security through Christ, these ten words right here, if God is for us, who can be against us? Those words right there ought to be enough. There's that word ought again. Are they enough? They should be enough to persuade us. They should reassure us. They should reassure you and me that we are safe in the hands of our Father God. So we look at that, and also the first verse of this chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, we, we look at that, we look at this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We should be joyful that God both saved us and also keeps us. The work he began in eternity past by foreseeing us, he will bring to a successful conclusion when you and I stand before him and hear the words. What are the words we're going to hear? What words do you want him to say? Well done, well done good and faithful servant. Enter, enter, into the enter into the joy of your Lord. Those should be the words that we want to hear and that we will hear. We, we have observed that there are those persons who are against us. To go back to the previous, previous verse, when, when it says, uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? We mentioned last week the implication of Paul's question is, who can successfully overthrow us, overthrow us, through, overthrow our salvation? The answer precedes that. If God is for us, and what did we do with that word right there? Since, Since God is for us, because God is for us. That is answered here. Since he's for us, who can successfully stand against us? And notice there's, it's kind of unspoken there. He wants his readers in Rome, he wants readers today to answer that question, nobody. Nobody can stand against us because God is for us. No one whether it be physical or spiritual, and we do have spiritual entities out there who are contrary to us, who are in fact enemies. But even they cannot nullify what God is doing within ourselves. Remember, salvation. It's not only an event that happened in your past. I can look back at a time and a place in which that happened to me. Some in the room are unable to fix an exact time and place where you came to faith, which is, which is fine, as long as you know you're a believer in the present. So we, we don't just look back as, and I, I've said this, I got saved at that point, at that place. But what we need to always understand is salvation is a continuing process. He saved me then. He's saving me now. He's going to continue to save me. That is an important point. If we look at salvation as something that occurred at a time and place and it's back there, well, what about now? But once we realize He continues to save us, 
that puts it in an entirely different spiritual light. We look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The Old Testament is full of what are called types, uh, examples, people or things which foreshadow what or who is coming in the New Testament. We've mentioned this before, literary styles of the Bible that, that we look at. You, you can look at people in the Old Testament in isolation, but how much better it just makes, makes them come alive when you're looking at them saying, okay, Joseph, for example, what are things about Joseph that prefigure things in the New Testament? Are there things about Joseph that allude to things that Jesus will do? And once you start having that in mind, you start looking at Old Testament characters, they're as real as, as someone standing right in front of you. It casts them again in a whole different light. So again, who is a father and son? We mentioned this last week. Who to a degree point to God the Father and Jesus, God the Son. His sacrifice. Who were they? Bom, 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 bom. <coughs> Father... Where is the sacrifice? God himself will provide the sacrifice, son. Abraham and Isaac. I failed you somewhere along the way. More quizzes coming. You can count on that. Abraham and Isaac. As Isaac was about, I'm sorry, as Abraham was about to let that blade fall. God stayed his hand and said, you have not withheld your son, your only son. It's at that point that Abraham and Isaac, as this incident points to Jesus on the cross, that's, that's where it ends. Remember, don't take examples in the Bible too far. Don't allegorize too much. Because God stayed Abraham's hand from plunging in the dagger. God the Father did not stay his hand. His own hand, did he? Now again, I, I have to mention this. I just saw a video which helps supplement some of the messages. And the speaker, nicest guy ever. Devoted man of God. He didn't quite carry the father's... Now, here we have gave his son up. What's preferable? Did he give him up or did he do what? Delivered him up. The speaker in the video didn't, didn't capture that. It was like things got dark on that day. God had to look away from his son. Yes, and, and what else was happening there? The wrath that was intended for you and I. Our punishment for sin descended upon the Son. Okay, so it's, it is it, <laughs> my poor son, I can't bear to look. It goes much further than that. That is a point that needs to be stressed, that we need to comprehend. Jesus, being a sacrifice, received the wrath of God the Father, to whom the debt of sin is owed. So, we see here, the Father did not stay his hand, but delivered his Son into the hands of evil men to be brutalized and put to death. We, we look further on in verse 32. He who did not spare, did not withhold his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all. We have to ask, who's the all? Are, again, from last week, good people, right? Jesus died for good people. How many are good? <coughs> there is no one good, no, not one. No matter what some people may want to believe about certain saints, there is no one good, nobody ever, not one. The Father delivered the Son for us, for people who were foreseen, predestinated, called, and who were to be justified. The Father didn't spare His Son on Calvary. Neither did He spare the Son His wrath upon sin. Why did Jesus say from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many, many of us sitting here today know that. The reason is, this was the one and only time in the eternal existence of God the Father and God the Son in which that relationship was to be broken and severed. Why? Because the Father cannot look upon sin and indeed poured His wrath out on His beloved Son. This is why Jesus said that. He was quoting it out of Psalm 92, I believe it is. Why have you forsaken me? He had to. Because he who knew no sin was made sin for us. The sentence continues in verse 32. Do watch the pronouns. But he who did not spare his own son, but gave him the son up for us all, how will he, the Father, not also with him, the Son, graciously give us, the elect, all things? Is God's graciousness limited to saving us? According to this, not. Because we have, have an expression here, give us, bestow upon us all things. And so we have to ask, what are those all things? If you were of a particular mentality, you could think, God wants me to have a cherry red Lamborghini Bugatti with a V16 and 1,500 ponies under the hood. God wants me to have that Bugatti. Yeah? You think so? Now, you and I sit here and you think, okay, Bob, you know, that's a ridiculous uh, example. I say not in some people's minds. Name it, claim it. They believe that God wants, okay, to quote, to quote the charlatan in Houston, God wants your best life now. I, and as I always say, you've heard me say this before, I'm redundant on purpose. I remember saying this, our best life is yet to be. Now, it's pretty good now because we know him, but the best is yet to come. The all things are the same as the all things from verse 28, the things that work together for our good. While knowing our physical material needs and wants, our Father is primarily concerned with our spiritual sanctification. The lust for extravagant material things will be pushed on our hearts but as Jesus said in Matthew 6, your heavenly Father knows that you need all them. Sorry, not a cherry red Bugatti. 
They are nice. Google it. Look at it and say, I don't need that. Our Father knows our needs. You know, does he, does he limit what he bestows upon us? And, and everything you have is from his hand. Everything. The paycheck, the job, everything we need. But I'm here to tell you, he also knows our wants. Sometimes our wants are a little, yeah, they're a little selfish. But you know, even in those things, I, I can give testimony that he's bestowed some things upon me and let me have some experiences that are just remarkable. Why? Out of his love. Matthew 6, your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God. And... Don't forget this. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Let all of us seek and receive the things that are going to grow us up spiritually. Paul's questions continue. Verses 33 and 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? <coughs> Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who, is, who indeed is interceding for us. <coughs> two verses, two questions. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? These look like separate questions. Not really. They are actually one and the same. The first asks, is there any possibility that someone could bring an accusation against us in that we have invalidated our salvation? This is what Paul's question is driving at. You can see right there, nothing. You can see it is God who justifies. But he is asking for us in our brains without him having to write it down and answer. So who shall bring any charge successfully against God's elect that makes that invalidates our salvation? Who? Nobody. The second question, who is to condemn? We look there, and he allows us to fill in the blanks with our mind. Who is it that will condemn us that you have lost your salvation? The answer? You hesitate to say nobody, do you? Because there's that little lingering doubt in the back of your mind, isn't there? Uh-huh. I can feel it. I can feel that doubt in the back of your mind. You know how I can feel the doubt in the back of your mind? I got it too. We're, I, 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 th I think we've been trained or wired or whatever to doubt. I, I think so. We, we, we have to work on that. And these verses from the pen of Paul 2,000 years ago to believers in Rome who he didn't even know, he never met them, are there precisely to give them a godly assurance. And these words have continued down the century for untold number of, of our predecessors, our fellow believers, to do the same, to give them assurance of their salvation. And yes, I have now lost my place. In these two questions, which are actually one, we have already been given the answer. To answer, 
who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's answered back here. If God is for us, who can be against us? There's the nobody. Nobody can. No one can bring a charge against us. The devil may accuse us, and we're going to see a verse here in a little while in which that, that is what devil means, accuser. He, he accuses us as he did with Job. But his charges are ineffective because of, again, it is God who justifies. First of all, if God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? No one. And why not? It is God who justifies. As we, we said this line last week, it bears repeating. If anyone could remove our salvation, they would therefore be more powerful than, than God. And we laugh and go, no one's more powerful than God. Yes, then, therefore, because no one is more powerful than God, what God has done cannot be undone. He would not undo what he has done. Why would he do that? The day is coming. Might bring up the Revelation reference. The day is coming when Satan can no longer do that. From John the Apostle. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of His Christ have come. Yeah. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Yes, we are being accused unsuccessfully. And remember that interaction between Satan and God over Job. Who initiated that? God did. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth. God initiated that. And then Satan, yeah, but it's only because you keep his hand on him and bless him. If all that was gone, he'd curse you. God initiated that. And we have that example of Job and his maintaining his testimony for God. It was kind of ugly. But yet he maintained that. But as we read here, the day is coming when the accuser is thrown down and eliminated us. The Father has justified us and continues to do so. To the question back in 34, who is to condemn? We again go back to chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So a few sentences before, he has already given the answer to the question that he's going to pose later on in verse 34. We not only are not condemned, we cannot be. We cannot be because of where we are. It is because of our position there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What is our position? There's a, there's a place where we're at. Where are we at? Or at? At least it's not purple haze. Okay? I got, I got to reset my phone. We cannot, we, we cannot have our salvation loss because of where, we're, where are we at? There's a preposition up there. In. Two letters. In. 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 There is no condemnation for those who are, there it is right there, in Christ Jesus. It's the example of marriage. We are essentially married to Christ. We are within Him. And where is Christ? It's not there, but we know that answer too. 
He is in the Father. He is in the Father. We are in Him. Therefore, we are in the hands of the Father. Is it also possible for someone could condemn us or prove we are in a state of condemnation? And we are, therefore, now lost? That was a question. Bad question, Bob. In these two questions, which, again, are actually one, we are given the answers. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? No one. Returning to verse 34, who is to condemn? Answer, no one can, because it is Christ Jesus who died. Who is to condemn? No one. Why? No one. Christ Jesus is the one who died. He died to seal our pardon. He paid the price. He was the one who became sin for us. He was the one who received God's wrath in our place. The condemnation fell on him, not on me, not on you not on us. There is no charge because we have been justified by the Father. Because Jesus was a satisfactory payment. What is the word that is in Scripture that means a satisfactory payment for a debt? Propitiation. Propitiation. That is in Scripture. That's not a theological term that we've had to make up in order to explain things. A propitiation is a satisfaction of a debt. Have you paid off your mortgage? Woohoo! You have propitiated that debt. You have paid it off. You know, oh, nobody, nothing. Keep your property taxes up. There is now, therefore, no more condemnation. It's a ludicrous notion that God's elect can fall into and out of salvation over and over and over again. Is what God has ordained from the foundation of the world so volatile that our justification exists only moment by moment? In all the things Jesus said from the cross, we sang it earlier. It is finished was his cry. What did that mean? We, we usually talk about this uh, on Good Friday. Did that mean, oh, I'm going to die now? No. The word that he used is a specific word meaning a debt has been paid. The debt of sin that is owed to the Father has been paid for by the sacrifice of the Son on the cross. That is why he said, it is finished. The plan, not plan C, not plan B, not even plan A, but the only plan that has ever existed in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, had then at that point come to fruition. It had been accomplished. It was his cry. Yeah, he yelled it. <laughs> been waiting, waiting all that time to been, be able to say that. It is finished. Philippians 1.6 and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Jesus Christ, whether we're here when he returns for his church, or whether we're here when he takes us individually in death, what he has started in us will be completed. And if, 
if that's not enough, there, there's more. We go back to 834. Paul just kind of piles it on here. It's like, Paul, have mercy. It's like, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Who is to condemn? No one. Why not? Christ Jesus is the one who died, who received that condemnation. More than that, Christ Jesus, who was raised. I'm sure that there were many Jews crucified by the Romans in first century Palestine, especially following the rebellion in AD 78, 79. But there was only one who, who was crucified who claimed the authority to forgive sin and then actually proved it. You could have any number of Jews who were crucified who had said, I can forgive sin. But there's only one guy who said that who actually proved it by doing what? By do How did he vindicate who he was and his work? He did what? He rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Meaning not just his own resurrection, but wins as well. For as in Adam all die. So in Christ shall all be made alive. No, we're not universalists. We know who the all is referring to. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Yes, the Lord physically rose into the sky 40 days after his resurrection to assume his rightful place beside his father. Yet, before that, Jesus fulfilled yet another function. It is the duty. I said is, was, and will be. The Jews are going to build that temple. It's going to happen. It was the duty of the high priest to enter into the Holy of Holies. How many times a year? One time. Okay, perhaps I'm, I'm straining uh, temple function, knowledge. There was, there was the tabernacle. There was Solomon's temple. There was Zerubbabel's temple. Zerubbabel's temple was expanded into Herod's temple. It is where they accomplished sacrifice. There's no temple now. There's no sacrifice going on in the Jewish belief because there's no place to do it. The high priest, once a year, would enter into the Holy of Holies, a.k.a. the most holy place, with what? He took something in. The blood of the sacrifice. And there, inside, when they did have the ark, he would sprinkle it on a particular place of the ark that's called the mercy seat. And when God saw the blood, he was satisfied, sort of. That is what would happen. The, the sacrifice was done for the sins of the people. This blood offering was inadequate. That's why I said, kind of, sort of. Although accepting this, the offering, the sacrifice of animals did not satisfy the demands of a perfect, righteous, and holy God. Critters didn't do it. It covered the sin, yes, but it didn't do what needed to be done, eradicate it. Let's be reminded, Christ ministered, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, but there is a function 
that he's going to accomplish. The high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year. He was the only one who could go in there carrying the blood of the sacrifice. That sacrifice was not a propitiation. It was inadequate to satisfy what God needed. There was only one sacrifice that could. Jesus took upon himself the roles. And this is curious. Did he become high priest? Yes, he did. But simultaneously, in his function as high priest, in presenting himself before his father, presenting himself as, as high priest, he was also the sacrifice. The high priest is the sacrifice. The sacrifice is the high priest. The high priest that had come and gone and come and gone and come and gone and come and gone out do, down through the centuries to get to this point, they would never have thought of themselves as a sacrifice. We have a high priest who himself was the sacrifice that was being presented. And it was sufficient. It was a sufficient propitiation to blot out our sins and to eradicate them. God remembers our sins how? No more. He puts them behind his back. He puts them in the deepest sea. This is language trying to communicate to us that when as, you, as we go merrily, merrily through our life, something comes up to remind us of who we were in the past. It is as though, and this is just Bob talking here, it's as though God needs to say to us, why do you want to remember all that stuff and feel guilty about it? I don't. The past is in the past. Is that part of our collective life? Can, can those things continue to have an effect on us? Yeah, yeah, I know that. But there is no more guilt for it. Yeah. It is covered by the blood of Jesus. And it was sufficient to blot that out by His grace through our faith. Hebrews chapter 10. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly over and over and over again the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So he lived, he died, he rose again, he presented himself to his Father as our high priest and as the adequate sacrifice also. Prophets. Prophets represent God to the people. High priests, priests, represent the people to God. And there he sat down at the right hand of his father. And, and we've mentioned this before, is that symbolic? You know, we talk about, you know, hey, you got Mike up here, you know, and he's my right-hand man, you know. He's a, that's not a figure of speech. He was actually seen at the right hand of the Father. Who saw him? Anyone know? Stephen. 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 As they were about to take his life, he, get, he gazed into seven. He saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father and said so. And so he sat down. But there's more. Back to verse 34. Okay, so we've got Jesus Christ who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is right at the right hand of the Father. More, who indeed is interceding for us. The work 
of our Savior continues unabated. While presenting his blood sacrifice once a year, the high priest was supposedly, and some of these guys were real losers, look at the high priest who, con who assisted in condemning Jesus and his dad. The high priest also functioned as an intercessor on behalf of the people to God to say who indeed is intercessing. Notice the stress right there. Who indeed? Paul wants to express that so we don't miss it. It's not just who is interceding for us. He indeed is intercessing. Is making an emphasis of what Jesus as high priest is doing at the present moment for us, the redeemed. That is happening now. And we should ask, well, what is that? What does it mean to intercede? What is Jesus interceding about? I know, Bob. He's interceding on our behalf to his Father for the forgiveness of our sin. Now, that's a common assumption. I would have thought that. No, he's not. If our sin has already been dealt with, he's not interceding for that because our sin has been permanently dealt with. We need to remember that Paul is writing to a group of persecuted people in the city of Rome. He's bringing reassurance to them, not in regard to their salvation, but that they would have the strength to endure the world's hardships and that their faith would grow. This is what he is interceding on your behalf and on my behalf for. We look at Hebrews chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He knows we're going to go through hardships, going to go through, go through frustrations, through persecutions. We're going to go through temptations. This is what he is doing on our behalf. This is his intercessory prayer. Although we could also refer to John 17, he also prays that we would be one as he and his father are one. These are the things he is in prayer about on our behalf. Simply because he rose up into the sky from the Mount of Olives doesn't mean that Jesus' work was done until he comes back to the earth. No. He is active even at this moment at the sight of his Father. He also prays that we will be with him. This is of John 17, that we will, when we are with him, we will see his glory. And this, when our confidence is shaken and doubts arise, be sure that we don't allow feelings, nothing more than feelings, we don't live in a Harry Nielsen song to dictate the truth. Use this up here. Feelings are deceptive. Use this up here and get assurance from this right here. When those things arrive, and they will, always, always go to the Word. 
and this. Hebrews 7. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. Of course. But he, who's the he? Say his name. Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he, Jesus, continues forever. Don't you like that? Consequently, because he continues forever, he is able to save, save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them.